All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 89. And I completely forgot to open all the articles, so you're going to have to watch me doing that. Uh, hey, Kaplerk, welcome to the stream. So this is the JavaScript news podcast, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we got some stuff today. There is... Again, I I don't know what's going on, but there's not that many things happening. There are some really cool minor announcements this week around, especially related to Node.js. And uh, yeah, we do get some pretty nice getting started section as well. Um, hey, not a number is a number. Welcome to the stream. All right. Um, I guess let's just get cracking. So the first section as usual is getting started to get you started with well, everything out there JavaScript related. The first article we got here for today is uh, the blog post from V8 team explaining the string prototype replace all function that is coming to the JavaScript uh, soon ish. I'm honestly don't remember which stage the proposal is at currently. I think it's like stage three or four already. Um, where's the proposal? Wait a second. Let me just be very slow this time around and just go, go into proposal. Yes, it is stage three already. So it's probably going to go to stage four quite soon and then get implemented in all the engines. So it's a good idea to know how exactly it works. Essentially, this is a very simple wrapper uh, for replace with a regular expression that allows you to replace everything instead of, you know, writing regex yourself. Exactly. This is very straightforward. It's very nice to have that because, you know, regular expressions might be a bit annoying. But uh, hey, this, yeah, it, it seems very convenient function to have. And I honestly don't know why it wasn't there uh, in the first place. I mean, a bit in this case, because, you know, in this case, regexes are usually look like this, right? So it's it's not typically big when you replace strings, at least in my cases, it wasn't never big. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have a function that does it, but it's not critical, I would say. But anyway, if you're curious about the replace all uh, for the string prototype, do check this article out. It does a good job of basically guiding you through how it works and how it will differ from the replace with the regex. Okay. Next thing we got here is the techniques for instantiating classes, a really cool write up on class instantiation and working with asynchronous methods that you have to invoke before instantiating class and the ways to solve that. So imagine you have some sort of a promise that have to download data or do something and then assign that data to a class in a constructor and how you deal with that. There's like a bunch of solutions listed here. So if you're just getting started, if you're working with classes and you have some asynchronous logic in there and you're not exactly sure how you deal with that, then this article is perfect for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's really straightforward. There's like a bunch of solutions here that are quite nice. Um, and uh, don't, yeah, I don't really have anything uh, more to say about that. So, you know, the uh, blog from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier is actually very good. So if you haven't read it yet, I would actually highly recommend reading all of his books and his blog because they are, uh, to be honest, fantastic. All right, continuing, we got RxJS with React hooks for state management, a pretty nice write up that guides you through using RxJS with uh, React hooks specifically. Uh, there is not much introduction to RxJS itself. So it kind of assumes that you know what RxJS is and how it works, but it does show you how you can quite easily use the React hooks to attach to the RxJS subjects in this case, specifically to uh, consume them within React tab without too many problems. And by the way, if you never tried that, um, then you know what RxJS is. Hooks are making work with RxJS almost a breeze. So it's really, really cool. So that sounds interesting Do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is the wise guide to react use state hook. This is a pretty detailed introduction to the use state hook with a listing of the uh, known pitfalls and caveats that you have to keep in mind while working with it. So if you are just getting uh, started with react hooks or react itself, then this is a very good starting point for figuring out how the uh, use state hook works and how to use it and what things to keep in mind with regards to pitfalls like stale state and complex state management and state versus reference and stuff like this. If you've been working with React for some time and you already know the hooks and stuff like this, you likely won't find anything new here. It is a very basic guide. Okay, continuing, we got having fun with ES6 proxies. This is essentially a tutorial for ES6 proxies that guides you through 
the basic setup of ES6 proxies and then using it to essentially wrap the object and uh, allow object chaining. I think this is what you call it, right? When you can uh, chain the methods on the object, but instead of you know returning the actual object, you use a proxy to allow executing the methods continuously, which is a bit of a contrived example, but I guess it works good enough to, you know, show you what exactly is happening and how to use proxies. So it's, yeah, it's fine. So if you wanted to get into proxies, this is a pretty nice uh, write-up. All right, uh, continuing, we got build your own React. Now, this is really awesome write-up that guides you through, well, building your own React, as the title says, and it does it so in a very interactive manner. So here on the left side, you got the code, and on the right side, you get description. And as you scroll down, both code and description will change dynamically, uh, highlighting the specific components and elements of the code that the author talks about which makes for an incredibly interactive and incredibly clear write-up on how the React works. So if you are interested in the internals of React, then this is possibly one of the best articles that I've seen out there. It walks you through you know, the stuff like create elements, J6, render function, concurrent mode, fibers, even stuff like reconciliation and hooks. So if you're working with React and you weren't exactly sure how it works under the hood, but always wanted to figure it out, then absolutely read through this. It is pretty long, like there is a ton of stuff here, but it is definitely worth it. Uh, it is up to date, it's just been written, like published on November 13, so it's very, very new. It has the hooks, uh, you know, which is a really newish feature. So it doesn't have the concurrent mode, I believe. Oh no, it does, ha it even has the concurrent mode. There we go, so it's very new. It's even uh, newer than the current stable React, so there you go. <laughs> All right, uh, continuing, we got uh, build Node.js command line interface using Yargs. Uh, this is essentially a small-ish tutorial for Yargs and building uh, CLI tools using it. Uh, if you never heard about Yargs, it's a very nice tool for building a command line interfaces and nodes. It essentially handles the parsing and command abstraction for you. So you ha basically can focus on just on the logic because parsing the arguments yourself is a bit of a pain in the ass. And Yark simplifies that for you. So if you ever wanted to build your own CLI tool using Node.js, then this tutorial will get you started with, well, at least the very basic version quite quick. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. And the last thing we got here for the getting started section for today is how Concurrent React changes the game for data-heavy UI. So this is yet another write-up on Concurrent React and Suspense. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know, another explanation of why Concurrent React is important, why does it matter, how will it change the game, specifically with the focus on data-heavy apps that have incredible amounts of data and how it will help make them, fa or at least, you know, perceived to be faster, let's put it this way. Uh, it's a really cool write-up. It does a very good job of explaining what exactly um, concurrent mode and suspense will help with. And again, you know, if you're still just getting into the whole concurrent mode suspense thing, I would recommend reading through that. Maybe this will clear up some things for you. Right, there we go. This is it for the getting started section. Now we are in the articles and news section. Today we got some interesting things here and there. So the first article we got here is algebraic structures, things I wish someone had explained me about functional programming. So this is a pretty neat write-up that uh, tries to explain things about functional programming and the algebraic structure from the software development perspective. So not, you know, not the whole like mathematical perspective as in when you talk about the sets and algebra and all that kind of stuff that can be a very confusing unless you know the algebra very well, right? Um, and port that, all this like functors, monads, and all that kind of stuff, closer to the programming side. So like how it can be applied, how can we use it? Why is it helpful? Why is maybe either an effect monads actually useful? What can we do with them? So I would actually say, like this is not an easy article to read anyway, because first of all, there's still some math here because you cannot actually escape that if you're going into functional programming. And second of all, it does assume that you have a pretty in-depth knowledge of the JavaScript itself. But if you are interested in, in functional programming, and if you are 
still trying to learn about it, but still confused about all this, you know, monads and algebraic structures and other things that seem scary. This is a really good write-up, so I would highly recommend reading through it. If you have no interest in functional programming, then well, you you know, this this is likely not for you. Right, next thing we got here is scaling WebSocket connection using shared worker. So this is a pretty interesting approach uh, to a very specific problem, let's put it this way. So the problem in this case is not that, you know, you have a clients, a lot of clients with a lot of sockets, but rather you have one client who might open a lot of tabs that would have to interact with the same server, right? And with a traditional architecture, we just say, okay, so we have one app per tab. That would mean that every tab opens a WebSocket connection to your server, maintains it, and then your server just dies because if user has 15 tabs, that means you have 15 connections open, which is not very efficient, right? So what the author here proposes is using a shared worker which essentially is the only thing that establishes connection to the server, right? And then every tab that opens afterwards just uses the shared worker to communicate with the API as a shared way to talk to the server, which is actually a very nice approach. So if you are working with an app that could be open in a lot of tabs and you have this problem where you have, like you, you're working with a WebSocket specifically because I guess if it's a REST API, then you won't really have that problem. But if you are working with WebSockets and have the problem with user having open 25 tabs and all of them need to maintain some sort of a WebSocket connection to your server, then this shared worker approach is a really cool one. So essentially every tab would just have like across all the 15, 20 or whatever tabs the user will open, you'll only have one shared worker that will handle all the connection, all, basically all the interaction with the server through one open WebSocket connection and then the tabs are just talking to the shared worker and uh, basically ask him to do things for them. A window stored, uh, no, it's not a window, right? So it's it's like a like the shared worker is basically a web worker that can be shared across the tabs of the same origin, uh, or essentially the same application, right? So the idea is that you start this shared web worker, it starts the connection to the server, it has some sort of a exposed API that the other tabs connect to and say, okay, hey, Shared worker, could you do this for me? And shared worker goes like, okay, I can reuse that. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't really have that in React. Um, it's like, this is completely unrelated to the rendering. So this is like the, the backend, the logic part, right? And this is a really, uh, no, the Webpack also doesn't have that. Uh, this is like, this is a pattern that you have to implement yourself. But anyway, if that sounds interesting, and if you're working with the app that has to maintain persistent connections, WebSocket connections to the server and can work across multiple tabs, I would highly recommend reading through that because it's a really neat approach. Uh, bear in mind, shared workers are not actually universally supported. So you might double check the compatibility table because for example, it doesn't work in Safari. It doesn't work in Edge, some Edge versions, I guess. I mean, it will work in a new one, right, obviously, but it's actually weird that <laughs> Safari is basically the only browser that doesn't support that. Uh, even Internet Explorer 10 supports that, which is surprising to be honest, but there we go. Anyway, uh, continuing, we got announcing the Bytecode Alliance, building a secure by default composable future for WebAssembly. So we got another initiative from uh, Mozilla that this time around focuses on uh, making WebAssembly more secure, I guess, right? Um, and also allowing to execute it in a better way, I guess, uh, outside the browser with regards to security. So again, it's all focused on the security and isolation and sandboxing. And uh, the gist is basically that, okay, so, you know, we could choose to run WebAssembly in some sort of a sandboxes and then the user is basically can do whatever he wants to protect themselves, which is not a very good idea because we already talked about that. There was this study of WebAssembly, I think one or two podcasts ago, where uh, the researchers found that actually nearly half of all the WebAssembly code that is deployed right now is used for malicious purposes. That is just insane. <laughs> So it's a good idea to have a proper secure WebAssembly sandboxing. And uh, the idea here is that like the gist is basically that typical applications that people build consist of like 20% of the app code and then 80% of other people's code, which means, you know, libraries, toolkits or whatever you use. Um, 
which you know sounds about right to be honest because we rely on other people's code quite a lot and uh, majority of the code you write is you know is super tiny in comparison to everything else you use and in javascript world it doesn't really like the thing is, is the whole thing is sandbox right so it's not a big problem but when you start working with WebAssembly. WebAssembly might access, especially on the system level, right? So WebAssembly might actually try to access stuff like memory, file system, network sockets, and even do some crazy stuff, right? Depending on the platform you're running it within. So this sort of sandboxing becomes a problem because you can no longer completely trust the uh, third party code, right? So there might be some nested dependency that suddenly goes malicious because of update or whatever, and then you are basically screwed. So the idea here is essentially to uh, split the um, sandboxing to a specific module. So you got the nano processes instead of a real processes, which have a less overhead and has faster communications. And this will basically as isolate the malicious code from everything else. So it will only talk to your app and will have a very constrained uh, resource um, space, I guess, to work with, which is a really cool idea. Flash player died because of security issues. We don't want. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the points, definitely. I think like the the idea here is that this still is going to be like the whole alliance is built around the idea of security, right? So this is not going to be the only way to run WebAssembly. It's just going to be baked in into this the tools that the Alliance builds, right? So we're still going to have third party vamp assembly runtimes that are not going to be secure by default. So if you want to go crazy, if you just want to blow up your system by running on secure web assembly, you're probably going to be able to do that in the long run. But um, it's just like, it's nice to see this kind of um, movements, I guess, you know, in a space to have a nice and secure way of running VASM by default, because it seems like VASM has a very bright future and uh, this is pretty exciting. So the article itself has a very long and detailed write up on how exactly this is gonna work, how exactly the sandboxing is gonna work, how exactly the key passing around is gonna work, like the permissions and malicious code isolation and all that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in details, absolutely do read through it as like, you know, as usual Mozilla hacks articles tend to be amazing and uh, Lynn Clark specifically tends to write just incredibly detailed and comprehensive posts. So, you know, highly recommend it. All right, continuing, we got um, next article called No Disabling a Button is Not an App Logic. This is a pretty neat write up about state and state machines and uh, in this case specifically React. So talking about, you know, okay, so we got this asynchronous logic and then you got to do something else that should switch the UI which is not exactly your typical business logic, right? So it's not, it's, you cannot consider that business logic. Um, I, yeah, I don't really, like it's a state machine article. I don't really have anything more to say about that, to be honest. It's a really good write up on state machines, but um, yeah, it's like, if you know what state machines are, you probably won't find anything new here. It is a very nice way of looking at the whole like UI paradigm and the state management. Um, but again, if you know what state machines are, you won't find anything new here. If you don't know, or maybe you don't completely understand that, I would highly suggest you read through that. Even if you don't understand React, it does a very good job of bringing the sort of use usefulness of uh, state machines to the um, developers, I guess. Uh, just notice, Donna, thank you very much for your donations. As always, highly appreciated. All right, the last article we got here for today is exceptions in a V8. So this is a very, very in-depth look into how exceptions work in V8, uh, as in, you know, the bytecode in-depth look. <laughs> so if you ever wondered how exactly does V8 handles exceptions, how does it interacts with the JavaScript and so on and so forth. How does it work on a C++ level and even on assembly level? Then this article is for you. It is crazy in depth. It is fascinating to read, to be honest. And uh, like you probably won't need that in your life, but it is very, very cool. So if that sounds interesting, absolutely check it out. It's not very long, but you know, this is like dark magic 101 is pro probably the best description of the whole article here. All right. And that is it for the articles and news. Now we got tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. And do we got some really cool stuff here today? So the first announcement here is that 
The ESM modules have just been unflagged in Node.js core. So they are now unflagged in Node.js master. Uh, from what I've read around the Twitter, they are going to be shipping ES modules enabled by default in Node version 13. And maybe they are still thinking about that. Maybe they will be backported to Node 12 LTS because it be, bleh, sorry, before it goes into maintenance mode. So this is very exciting, which means we're going to see the um, ES modules in Node.js in next month, I guess. So before the end of the year, absolutely. This is this is something we waited for ages and uh, it's really cool to finally see it happen. And the the final solution is actually really, really cool, uh, backwards compatible to CommonJS and there's like uh, some very nice uh, features there. So if you are excited, you can check it out right now. There are experimental builds of Node.js version 13 that you can install using NVM if you like really want to jump on it right now. Uh, I believe there is not like the documentation is not quite up to snuff just yet. But again, you know, the release of Node 13 with the ES modules enabled by default is coming soon. So uh, yeah, I guess we're probably going to be talking about that once it releases in a week or two or maybe three. I don't know. Let's see, but it's gonna happen soonish. So anyway, really cool, really cool to see that. Next thing we got here is the uh, neat hack that Dan Abramov learned from uh, Seb Marbich uh, on hot reloading of Node app on every request by delaying the require in development. So this is like, I tried to implement hot reloading in Node.js, like specifically in Express apps a couple of times and it kind of looks like this. But the idea of just essentially dynamically requiring stuff in development is pretty neat. So the, the gist is that instead of applying your logic immediately, you actually run require on every request, right? Which means when if you run this on production, the require is going to be cached. So it's only going to be executed one time. So you're going to be fine performance wise. But if you run it in development modes, every request, you can just kill that cache and the require will be re-executed, which means that every request will have the most frequent, like the, the up-to-date version of the code, which is exactly how hot reloading works, right? Which is a really neat feature, like a really neat trick. So there you go. Okay, the next thing we got here is, um, I think I did know the HTML actually has native support for autocomplete style uh, dropdowns attached to input via the data list elements. So you can make a select element using input, which has autocomplete, which is, I didn't, like I didn't know data list was a thing in HTML. And there's like an example here and it works exactly as you would expect it. Uh, like, just look at that. This is native. Like I, there's zero JavaScript in here, which, which is really cool to be honest. And this also works on mobiles, by the way, which is even better. So there you go. If you didn't know, now you know. Uh, I certainly didn't. This is like a really cool feature and uh, I probably will use it a bit more now. Okay, next thing we got here is announcement from NPM. They've added funding support to package JSON. So instead of all the messages that you get post install that everyone hated in console, you now have the funding uh, property in package JSON file that you can specify and running NPM funding will actually show you all the packages that NPM fund, sorry, that uh, have the funding specified and including the type of funding and the URL where you can go and back the specific package, which is actually awesome. So that's a very welcome change and a very nice addition to the NPM ecosystem. Has science gone too far? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's like, have we gone too far of being too lazy to read the official specs? I guess we are. <laughs> All right, continuing, we got a really nice thread from Dan Abramov on why suspense matters. So this is, um, this is not quite similar to, you know, why the concurrent mode will be good for apps or why the suspense will be better for large apps and stuff like this. But instead, it's more on a logical side on the side that okay, suspense actually gives you confidence in the UI being consistent with the state, right? Because react basically guarantees that if you say so if you check a condition and return a or else return b, this is something that works 100% in react and very easy to reason about right as a developer. 
The thing is that this becomes a mess as soon as you bring on any type of asynchronicity saying, okay, we have some asynchronous requests. And then once it's going to finish, we're going to figure out the condition and only then we're going to render something or other thing. And then there's nested components. And suddenly all of that simple reasoning becomes very, very complex, right? Suspense takes and abstracts all of that complexity related to asynchronicity behind the asynchronous data fetching. So we just say, okay, so components just say, okay, I wanted this data fetched. I don't care how, I don't care when, just fetch it and then I can show it, right? So this is basically what suspense is about. And by doing that, you remain, you retain this simplicity of React by saying, okay, if condition return A, else return B. But then you also get the whole asynchronous way of fetching the data and working with it in the background in a way that React essentially doesn't care about, which is a really good point, something I never thought about. And uh, I, again, you know, it's, it's my, my sort of summary of the whole thread because it's a bit more, there's a bit more details to it than that. So if you're working with React, if you're curious about suspense, I would encourage you to read that. It's a really good point. And I never thought about it before reading that thread, but it makes a lot of sense. So yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, continuing, we got a JavaScript um, survey slash web almanac by the uh, HTTP archive. So sort of the overall stats on whatever is used uh, on the web because you know, HTTP archive guys basically archiving the web. So they have a really nice way of tracking what kind of libraries are used, what kind of frameworks are used what is the sizes of the pages. And I'm not sure why exactly half of the stuff is not showing. I guess it's my ad blog. There we go. Now, one of the, like, it's, it's a really big write up. There's like a ton of things that they explore. One of the things I want to highlight here is this uh, quote from the tweet that says, given the volume of chatter in the dev world, you'd be forgiven for thinking that react is used on the majority of websites today. The real number 4.6% of the websites. So just, just think about it for a second, just 4.6% of the websites on the web use React. You know what is the dominant library for UI? It's jQuery. It still takes 85% and 83% on mobile, which is <laughs> even crazier when you think about it. So next time someone says you the jQuery is outdated. No, absolutely not. jQuery is still totally fine, totally works. And even jQuery UI is damn popular. Like look at this, 23% and 21% on mobile. This stuff, like jQuery is still dominating the web and it's still, I mean, it's still a nice library. It's just React is a lot easier to reason about and a lot easier to work with, but uh, that's a different question. Right, uh, yeah, yeah, again, you know, if you're curious, do check out the whole write-up. It's very interesting to see the React has actually doubled the number of AngularJS, which is uh, kind of crazy. The Angular is very tiny. So I think AngularJS is the old one, right? I always confuse them because this naming is just, crazy like you got angular which is angular is the new one and angular js is the old one or is it the other way around yes angular is the new one and angular js is the old one so the new angular basically almost never used everyone is still on old angular js version 1.0 which is just bonkers and we got backbone js at 1.8 percent that is still somehow around and still being used and <laughs> Um, yeah, so they like, again, you know, just, just go through it. There's some incredible statistics there. It's fascinating to read and, uh, uh, quite eye-opening to be honest. Let me have a look at the chat. Maybe we're starting to migrate this pro. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to see the percentage of react and angular apps increase over time, obviously. But, uh, the thing is that majority like react makes sense when you build something big, right? So when you big a complex website, when you build a web app, when you build, um, I don't know, a dashboard that has a lot of interactive elements, when you build something stupid that has a button that sends an email, you don't need React. Like jQuery is more than enough. And most of the time you don't even need jQuery now. You can just use like document query selector and you're done basically, right? jQuery is just a bit nicer because you don't have to write I don't know, XHR requests or whatever, but now we have fetch. So there's even less reasons to use jQuery, but still, you know, if you're used to jQuery, you know that you're going to make it faster with jQuery then why the hell not. But anyway, let us continue. The next thing we got here is uh, moving towards a faster web. So the, now this is a slightly controversial announcement from Chrome dev team. Um, here's the thing. So the Chrome starting the one of the next versions, 
is going to be showing the message that the website is loading, usually loads slow is what they say, right? So they're going to show, <clears throat> they're going to show the loading splash screen and say, okay, this site loads slower than usual. So you have to wait a bit and basically shame websites that have poor performance, which is kind of like on one hand, I can see how this can be beneficial because nobody would want people to see this message. So they would actually probably try to spend some resources in optimizing that. On the other hand, this is kind of, you know, the Google abusing their position on the market to, um, well, the thing is that not every website has to be incredibly fast and not every website has to load within whatever the time that they allocate, right? So the, here's the question, who's gonna control what is the time that we are allowed to be slow? Because if I have a website, like I have my personal website, right? Okay, right now it's just a text website. So nothing like there's not much stuff that loads long from it. So it's fine. What if I have my personal website that is a bit slowish because I don't personally care about it too much. There's like, you know, a few links and maybe some documents in there. And I don't want Google to shame me because, you know, I, um, uh, okay, there was a better example than my website. One of the really good examples on Reddit was a local shops that sell specifically to one region. So imagine like Germany, right? So there's like German hosters and a lot of German businesses they host within Germany, which means that I am, I'm as a person living in Germany, we're, we're gonna get the loading times that are pretty damn fast, right? On the other hand, a person go into that website from outside of the Germany, be it like, I don't know, North America, for example, it's gonna get loading times that are a lot worth. So how is, Google, how is Google gonna measure that? Is it gonna be like average across all their data centers or is it gonna be location specific? And there's a lot of questions about that. And I, I have a one specific question for Google. Are they gonna add that badge to the Gmail? Because if you ever tried to load Gmail, even on desktop, it is abysmally slow. If that is gonna force the Gmail team to finally update the Gmail to make it faster, I'm all in for that, to be honest. But yeah, it's it's a bit of a controversial decision. It's I don't like I don't know how I feel about it to be honest, but yeah, it's it's a bit weird. It's like we're gonna see where that goes, but uh, yeah, that's it's you know a bit controversial, is it? <laughs> as I already mentioned. But okay, continuing, we got another survey results. So this is the front end tooling survey 2019. The results uh, there is. Um, it's a yeah, front end tooling survey. They asked uh, for um, 3,005 developers, 27 different questions covering a wide range of front end tools and methodologies. And this survey is really big. So if you're working with front end tools and you wanna know how the landscape looks in 2019, absolutely check it out. I don't wanna go through that right now. There's like <laughs> too much stuff to talk about. But it's, you know, it's nice to have a sort of overview. Uh, it's always worth going through those. Okay, continuing, we got two announcements that are pretty damn neat in my opinion. The first one is Code Sandbox just announced their own CI. So you can actually uh, add Code Sandbox is a GitHub app now and it can run CI for you, which uh, means you can even just go into the Code Sandbox and edit your stuff review the fixes online, adjust them right in the code sandbox and just commit back to the repository, which is actually really awesome. So this is like amazing tool. And I honestly can see that getting purchased by Microsoft and integrated into the GitHub uh, itself in a few years, if you know, at least if I would manage GitHub, this is what I would do because this is like literally one of the features that GitHub is missing, right? The ability to just edit, test, and commit it back to GitHub right in place in a pull request without starting up your local installations or whatever, at least for some types of projects. Like this is just really, really game changing. So if you're curious, do check it out. There's a whole post with the write-up. Uh, you can try it out. It's gonna be free for open source projects as far as I understood. And you know, if you want private, then you have to pay as usual, but it's a really nice addition. Right, and the next announcement we got here and the final for today is the Gatsby Cloud. So the team behind Gatsby is launching their own uh, cloud system that is gonna be building and deploying your websites. Um, it's gonna be free for small websites and then you obviously gonna pay for you know enterprise or whatever deployments. Uh, 
you can go and uh, sign up and uh, it actually works relatively well. So I tried to build the BXJS website with it. Um, it builds it and deploys it and you get this test URL that you can just check out and see the whole website deployed. Now, the thing that is missing for me, so uh, the cool thing is that they have the free free plans, right? This is awesome. Now, the thing here is I would want this builds thing that is coming soonish that will automatically generate previews for you when you push to any branch or any pull request. Like this is the killer feature. So if I would, this is one of the features that I really want for a couple of websites. And this is like, it's coming soon, right? And I can't wait for that because having an ability to have a Gatsby website where you can open a pull request or, you know, someone's open a pull request towards your project and you can immediately see a visual preview for it is freaking amazing. I wanted to do this with uh, Exoframe, but maybe I don't have to anymore. This just looks amazingly exciting. We'll see how that develops. Um, let me have a look at the chat. Uh, hey, Laser, welcome to the stream. Uh, Kepler, I feel old. I remember that only test when I started developing were just calls to functions and check if everything, I mean, this is what you call unit tests, right? <laughs> but uh, unit tests are, I mean, they're usually not sufficient to be honest. I think we already talked about the topic more than once here, but anyway, <laughs> let's just continue. All right, so this is it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we got a couple of releases. The first one is uh, JSAP, which is the JSOC, uh, what's it called actually? JS Green SOC, what was the AP for? I don't remember to be honest. Was, there, was it actually, the, did they just shorten it to something that is just now for war, four letters? Uh, seems so. Okay, so JSAP, which is the Green Sock animation library, right? Uh, it was initially built for Adobe Flash and Action Script. Now it is JavaScript, and they just released version three, which is, I believe, rewritten in TypeScript and um, half the size and a lot more optimized and uses keyframes and has ES6 modules. And it just looks amazing, to be honest. And it also has a farting turtle animation if you if you want that. I <laughs> Yes, you can, you can do that with um, JSAP3 now. It's it's really awesome. So if you're working with animations a lot, do check it out. It's actually quite damn cool. All right. And the last, like second and the last release, I guess we got today is the Brave uh, browser version 1.0 that is now available on all platforms, including iOS, Android, and a bunch of others. Um, it's probably the easiest browser if you want uh, ad blocking, privacy protection, and all that stuff, and I want to fiddle with uh, U block and U matrix and stuff like this. It is really great. It works really nice out of the box without any modifications. Um, has a very nice UI and it's really damn fast. So if you you know if you have I I like I personally use it on mobile because it's just very easy to set up there and very easy to toggle the. I by default on mobile. I have the JavaScript disabled because the mobile web works best without JavaScript, to be honest. And then the Brave essentially has this uh, Shields button that allows you to toggle JavaScript off and on really quick for the cases where I either want some interactivity or, you know, crappy websites that don't work without JavaScript disabled if I am interested enough in the content to actually do that. Uh, but aside from that, I, this is actually the browser I recommend to all the, you know, parents, grandparents, whatever, because you literally just flip two toggles and you're good to go. And majority of malicious code is actually going to be caught by it. So it's a really good um, thing for lazy people and old people, basically. Let's put it this way. <laughs> um, okay. That is it for Lisa's. Now we got libraries and demos. We do have... Quite a bit really cool one here. Uh, first one is the pretty big announcement from the Babel team, uh, the preset modules. So this is the new modern preset for the browsers, uh, for all the modern browsers, right? Which account for 88% of traffic that essentially allows you to build the Babel code for um, that basically for browsers that support ES modules, right? Which again is like majority of them right now. And this actually results in a smaller bundle, more efficient codes, less garbage from, or not garbage, less, you know, the less uh, polyfilling code, let's put it this way, from Babel because you no longer need that. And 
yeah, you can you can still minify it, obviously, to make it even smaller with Terraster. There's even tips here. So if you are shipping codes and one of your targets is modern browsers, which is, you know, likely it is, and you're using Babel, so you can now compile for two different bundles. So you can compile for legacy if you need that. And you can compile for modern using the preset modules. And you can get a bundle that is a lot smaller than what you had before, which is just awesome. So quite highly recommended. Do check it out. This seems like an amazing addition to the Babel presets. Quite excited to see how that develops. And uh, yes, and it will be merged into preset amps eventually. So this is sort of the preview build basically uh, that, I mean, you can use it right now. It's, it's all tested and working and nice and everything. But in the end, the sort of the main target for it is to disappear into Babel preset env, which is uh, also great. Right, uh, next thing we got here is React change highlights. A React component to highlight changes constantly. So it's basically, yeah, it's just, you know, as soon as the component re-renders, it sort of highlights the changes. Useful for stuff like uh, checkouts where your price changes and, you know, maybe some other cases you have in mind. Super straightforward, nothing fancy here. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a nice tiny React component. Next thing we got here is fault line. Um, generate terrain images using fault line formation algorithm. Yep, this, I like, I... <laughs> I don't know why would I need that or why any of you would need that, but maybe you do. Um, it looks really cool. So it's an implementation of fault line algorithm. I believe it also uses uh, web workers to parallelize it and actually run it in parallel. If is if if that's if I remember correctly, at least maybe I am confusing things. Um, data Promiseify. No, I think I'm confusing it with some other algorithm I read about during this week. So this one does not do that. But anyway, if you are into terrain generation for some reason, do check it out. This this looks pretty cool. Right, next thing we got here is Paged.js. This is a paged media, basically um, open source library to paginate content in the browser. That looks pretty damn fancy and has a ton of features and um, seems pretty flexible. So if you're working with a data that needs to be paginated and you want to do it directly in a browser, then do check this one out. There's like a ton of things you can do with that. And uh, yeah, it seems to be pretty established. I never heard about it before actually, but it's it seems very nice. And it's also based on WGC spec. So, you know, spec compliance and all that stuff. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Tenko, 100% spec compliant ES2020 JavaScript parser written in JavaScript. Um, yeah, there you go. So it's yet another JavaScript parser written in JavaScript. This one is actually 100%, as it says, a pixel perfect spec compliant for ES6 up to ES611. So all the modern stuff is here. They even have the REPL that you can try out in the browser. I like I yeah, I mean, I personally have rarely have any cases where I have to work with JavaScript parsers, but maybe you do. So do check it out. It actually seems pretty damn nice. Right. Next thing we got here is Anima Vita trigger life saving alerts, register animals for adoption and find closest pet friend to adopt. So this is more of a, um, a learning project, I guess, than anything else. I mean, I like the idea behind it. So sort of the um, shelter adoption uh, slash animal rescue project, right? That uh, is aims to help you find next pet to adopt or help someone save a pet or whatever. Um, it looks very fancy actually. So it has the mobile app and everything. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, built from like React Native style components, CSLint, MongoDB, Redux, GraphQL, Apollo, whatever, like there's a bunch of technologies in there. So if you want to learn about those, do check it out. Or maybe you just want to support the animal rescue effort, then that's also a nice way to do things. Uh, they have like Patreon and stuff. Uh, so yeah, just check it out if that sounds interesting. Right, next thing we got here is the React Adaptive Hooks, a new set of hooks from Google Chrome Labs. So this one is super neat ones. It's uh, hooks that allow you to deliver experience best suited to a user's device and network constraints. So it's a device and network aware hooks that allow you to uh, basically adapt your app based on the user's connection. So I think we already talked about the article from Google that talks about this sort of um, you know, the resource network device constraints 
based uh, changes to the app, like the progressive enhancement and stuff, right? And this basically gives you hooks to do exactly that. So for example, you can get the network status and then switch your image based on the network status. So, you know, you serve lower resolution image for slow to G and then depending on the network, you can go from static image up to the video that is actually a lot higher resolution, which is uh, super nice. But super, what did I just say? Super nice is what I wanted to say. <laughs> And they have hooks for uh, saving data for CPU cores and hardware memory restrictions and stuff like this. So if you're working a lot with the web based versions, and you want to optimize for the uh, uh, specific restrictions, then do check it out. It's actually super damn nice. I probably should start as well. Okay, next thing we got here is react screenshot test a dead simple library to screenshot test react components. So this is specifically a testing library that allows you to, well, basically make a screenshots from the react components and then compare them to make sure they actually look exactly the same, right? And if not, then well, it's gonna can throw an errors basically. And uh, yeah, it looks straightforward and nice. So if you're working with react components, and want to do the visual testing, do check it out. And the last thing we got here for today is Linkinator. Uh, it's basically a command line tool that uh, crawls your website and lists you all the broken links that you have over there, which you can also dump into a CSV, for example, to inspect later on, which might be handy if you are in charge of maintaining some legacy websites that can be a pain in ass to monitor and find broken links in. So, you know, it's very straightforward, but uh, can be very handy. Okay, that is it for the libraries and demos. We got three more things to talk about today, which are pretty neat. So the first one is this uh, write up from the brave team on fingerprinting and private. Uh, what is wrong with me? Privacy budgets. Uh, so this is a really cool write up um, talks about, um, first of all, about the fingerprinting and how does the advertisement and tracking industry tracks you within a browser specifically by, um, you know, doing different things. And uh, but what do you mean ironic brave talking about privacy? I mean, they are very privacy focused, like the privacy is their primary selling points. Uh, can you Kepler, can you elaborate because I'm not sure I understand why is it ironic, to be honest. But anyway, back to the article. So first of all, they talk about the protections against fingerprinting, like, you know, removing the functionality or blocking the access to it, determining access by trust, adding randomness and determining access access thresholds, which is the privacy budgets which is the new Google take on the privacy that they say they're going to add to Chrome that is supposed to combat this sort of heavy tracking. And then they go into details of explaining why dynamic, uh, dynamic privacy budgets, in their opinion, are not exactly going to work out that well. So it's, it's a very interesting insight into how the ads industry works and uh, how exactly it might actually they might track you and how exactly you can combat that. And why does Google's um, new approach might not quite work out as well as they hope. Again, you know, since Google in, is into the ads business, I don't think they actually want their approach to work extremely well, because they want to work it, they want to have the approach that works to some extent so that they can say, Hey, guys, look, we're actually good, we're protecting you from tracking online. But on the other hand, they wanted to work a bit worse so that they can actually track you across the websites using Google Capture or you know, whatever, to actually have a full profile on you so that they can sell the targeted ads better because this is their main income. So you know, it's like I, I, I get why they are making it this way, basically. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting write up. So if you're interested in privacy and tracking, I would highly recommend reading it. Okay, next thing we got here is node watch. Now that's the thing I did not expect to see. So this is um, world's first hackable open source JavaScript powered TensorFlow powered smartwatch. So let's decompile that. Um, first of all, it's a smartwatch, right? And uh, you can actually assemble it yourself. So it's completely open source. They list all the parts they have here and you can just go ahead and assemble it on your own if you want to. It is a pain in the ass to do, so I would, would not recommend. It's probably not gonna look as good as what they have here. But if you want to, you can just back it right now on a Kickstarter and get the assembled thing from them. Uh, it is actually really cheap. So if you're interested, it goes for just 
uh, 47 Great British Pounds or about 55 Euro. You can go to the Kickstarter and have a look yourself. Um, now, the other parts that are interesting are, first of all, it works on top of JavaScript and it supports TensorFlow on it. So you can run your own JavaScript apps right on the watch and they have like an open source store so you can actually, you know, publish stuff and, and run it from there. It looks really cool. Now for I like when I when I saw people in our research group discussing this Kickstarter specifically, they were like, eh, this, you know, looks a bit risky because it's a Kickstarter, we might not actually get it. But here's the deal. So this smartwatch is actually already so this is not some sort of a random prototype or whatever. First of all, it's made by the near form the company that's been around the Node.js ecosystem for ages. And second of all, they've actually given out those things as the badges for the NodeConf EU this year round. So the people who went to the NodeConf EU already have this watch that is already working. And there's like a lot of tweets if you want to search around. Uh, that's well, yeah, that actually work pretty damn nice. Um, it looks pretty neat. I honestly don't know if I would personally use that. <laughs> To be honest, I would probably play with it and then put it in a drawer and forget about it. Um, but it's a very neat project. It's a very neat hackable project. Uh, it's IP68 waterproof, so you can even dive up to 10 meters with it if you want to. I don't know why, but there you go. Um, what are they using as a UI? I honestly have no idea. I have not dived deep into the whole um, sort of underlying technology on it. I just know that there is the JavaScript thing and it's supports gestures and stuff like this. And you can do TensorFlow to do crazier things. Um, building Bengal Kickstarter buttons and touch. Let's see, what does it support? Installing app from App Store, programming your node watch. There we go. Um, Espuino web. Okay, so they have the web IDE that you can use to just do it on the web where oh, there we go. Let's see. So web ID tour set interval. So you got, okay, I guess you just got the LEDs basically that you write there. Yes, uh, Donna is just uh, 50, uh, 60 euro, is it actually less than that 55 euro with the current uh, conversion radio. So it's like 47 great British pounds is the original price. So just convert that to your, um, to your uh, currency. Uh, German accent. I might have some German accent because I've been living in Germany for quite some time, but I'm actually Russian. So I, I guess it's a mix of Russian and German accents by, by at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, it looks like you directly just control the LEDs on it. Probably. I don't know. That's like, it's still, there's probably somewhere get started. Um, TensorFlow over microcontrollers, initial blog post. Buttons and touch, pre-installed apps, figure out eight motion. So it has the Bluetooth, App Store. Uh, it's a tricky question. Like they have the clocks and everything. So I assume there is some simple way to display stuff on it, but I don't know. Honestly, if you're interested, just go and explore. It's it's a really cool project anyway. And it's like, it's 55 euro is nothing for this stuff. So JS has been on embedded development for a long time. Like, come on, there's this, um, uh, what was it? The, the robots, uh, robot JS. What was the Johnny, what was the name of it? Johnny five or whatever that was, there's the cyclone JS. First of all, right. This was the first thing as uh, the robotic, basically JS for robotics. And there was the, uh, body JS. There was Johnny Five. There we go. This is what I wanted. Johnny Five is another Arduino Raspberry Pi robotic IoT platform that has been around for ages, and I think it's already way beyond version 1.0. So it's like if you want to write JavaScript for embedded devices, you can. And it's actually extremely easy to do. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, um, if that sounds interesting, do check out Node Watch. It's a really cool project, and uh, yeah, <laughs> one of the things is. Um, just look like they needed a very little amount for Kickstarter and then they collected it in, I think the first day or something, which is just insane. Uh, you're really into JS scene. Are you a JS whisperer? I mean, you can call me JS whisperer. JS is my primary language and has been for the past, I don't know, seven years, I guess. But I'm using it along with 
uh, Python, Golang, Java, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know. But I do enjoy JavaScript a lot, so I've been tracking the scene for quite some time. And yes, this is like the primary language that I use and I really enjoy writing it. So yes, um, I guess JS Whisperer, the, I'm also terrible at speaking. So JS Whisperer is probably, I'm probably better at whispering than talking. So that sounds about right. <laughs> All right, um, the last thing I got here for today is um, the GitHub change log. So if you haven't heard about it, the GitHub had the, um, GitHub, oh God, what was the name of it? GitHub Universe, that, that was the name of it. So there was the GitHub Universe conference where they announced a bunch of things that are coming to GitHub. Uh, first of all, GitHub Actions and GitHub Packages are now generally available, so you no longer have to be in beta to use them. You can just go ahead and grab it and start using it. The We're finally getting GitHub Mobile, that is a proper mobile app that is like actually goods, not the stuff that we had before. It is only beta for now and you have to join the waitlist for it uh, if you're interested, but it actually looks really good. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, another exciting thing, we got uh, code search improvements for GitHub. So you can actually finally will be able to search for code on GitHub without getting a lot of garbage. That is something that I wanted on GitHub, I, I think forever, basically. It's like, for some reason, searching GitHub was abysmal and it seems like they're finally improving that. So it's really cool. They're also going with the GitHub advisory database, uh, security lab, and they're gonna have a GitHub archive. Where's the mention of that? Um, there was a really cool announcement about GitHub Archive where they plan to archive all the open source software they have to preserve it for future generations, which looked like a really, really cool project. Where is it? Why is it not here? Um, is it this one? No, this is something third party. Or, no, this is not it. GitHub Archive. There we go. There's the archive program. Which, yeah, so they're, they're, they're going to have a GitHub Arctic code world. <laughs> It sounds insane, but this is like also really awesome. It's it's just amazing. Uh, but yeah, there you go. This is basically it from my side. So uh, now's the time to ask your questions and send me your articles or tools that I missed this week. I will be more than happy to talk more or answer your questions. So we got a question. What is your setup tool chain tech stack boilerplate for distributing cross-platform with JS? I don't have a fixed uh, tool chain tech stack or whatever. I typically just pick and mix uh, based on the requirements. I find this to be the best way to work, but I do like React. I do like Electron. I do like web apps in all their instances. I do like Babel. I do like uh, Rollup. That pack is a bit too heavy for my liking when I have to deal with it personally. If it's a part of something like Next.js, then I'm all in. If I have to configure it manually, then I likely will nope out of it and go to something lighter like Rollup again. I uh, hope that answers your question. Right, so if you have any questions or more questions or suggestions, throw them into the chat right now. Uh, meanwhile, I will just go and say that you can find all the mentioned links on the BXJS Weekly repo or on uh, bxjs.dev, we have a new website and it's now Gatsby static pre-built with everything, with all the fancy links and everything here. So uh, yeah, uh, we also have a Discord server where you can come and uh, chat about that stuff. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Uh, would you be willing to do an SSR tutorial? I honestly have not dealt with SSR that much as in, you know, from the setting it up myself because it's really hard. I would just suggest taking an existing SSR solution like Next.js, for example, all in one, you know, you don't even have to think about that and then just use that. Um, I already did a video on Next.js, if that's what you're interested about, you can just have a look at it. Develop and React, my mentor is Eric Elliott. Eric Elliott has uh, some nice articles. He tends to be a bit too extreme in his views for my personal taste, but uh, he does, quite some nice things here and there. Right, um, okay. Any more questions or suggestions? If not, then uh, as usual, thank you guys very much for watching. We can wrap it up here for today. Thank you for your uh, continued support and all that kind of stuff. Again, you know, if you wanna chat and um, 
discuss any of the links and you missed the podcast, the VOD will be available on the Twitch and YouTube in just a few minutes. If you want to chat, join our Discord. Uh, if you need help with JavaScript, also come there. I will try my best to help you. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. All right, doesn't seem like we got any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.